So now we will apply uh, whatever we have learned so far to solving problems in uh, real materials and we'll, in particular the first kind of material that we will consider are nonlinear elastic materials and before uh, going into the discretization process uh, we will uh, describe a little bit uh, the constitutive equations that govern these kinds of materials. So uh, recall the clausius duhem inequality that we have learned and in the clausius duhem inequality you would remember that the dissipation rate, the rate of dissipation has to be greater than or equal to zero. In case of an elastic material which is reversible, there is no dissipation, it is a reversible material, so d int is equal to zero. Uh, on top of that, uh, we will uh, use the free energy per unit volume which we will call psi naught, free energy per unit reference volume which we will call psi naught. Uh, in place of the of the uh, internal energy and the, uh, and the entropy. So uh, if we write psi naught as rho naught times uh, e naught minus theta, uh, this should be a capital theta, capital theta times eta naught. Then uh, we can uh, we can take derivatives on both sides. So we can write psi naught dot is equal to rho naught e naught dot minus theta dot eta naught minus theta eta naught dot. So uh, we have theta eta naught dot and e naught here. So uh, psi naught dot plus rho naught theta dot eta naught is equal to rho naught e naught minus theta eta naught. So uh, this term, which is here, we replace by psi naught dot plus rho theta dot eta naught. So after having done that, uh, we further assume that thermal effects are not important in this uh, in in the problem that we are considering. So temperatures are not varying either with space or with time. That which means that this is equal to zero. These uh, these terms go out of the window. Window theta naught is also equal to zero, and so this is zero. This is zero because it's not a thermal problem, and we are left with P F dot is equal to zero again because equal to zero because we are dealing with a reversible material. Now, if this is the case, then we can envisage a constitutive equation where psi, uh, psi naught is a function of the deformation only and if we assume that then uh, then obviously psi naught dot will be equal to so put this back into our clausius duhem inequality which is now this so you have p f dot minus which means that this quantity is zero. And now if f dot and f can be varied independently of each other, so varying f dot does not affect f, therefore does not affect the term inside the parenthesis, then we can imply that p is equal to del psi naught del f. So if we can if we can find uh, if we can find a free energy density function per unit reference volume psi naught which is a scalar function we can take its derivative with respect to f and find the first peak stress so this gives you the constitutive equation of what is known as a perfectly elastic material so this is a special case of a material special case of elastic materials which are uh, known as perfectly elastic materials as you will see that um, it depends only on the deformation gradient f and uh, this is its this is its constitutive equation so we will have a form of psi naught and take its derivative with respect to f we'll get the first peak stress uh, there's one 
point that I want to mention here, there are a uh, set of, these are compressible perfectly elastic materials. We have assumed that these are compressible elastic, uh, perfectly elastic materials. If it is incompressible, then J, which is equal to det F, is always equal to 1 for throughout the deformation process. So, J dot is 0 for incompressible materials. These materials are called incompressible because the volume is conserved throughout the deformation. So, for incompressible materials, J dot is equal to 0 and we know that J dot is J trace D that is equal to 0 and we also know that F dot is LF. D is the trace of L uh, trace of D is equal to trace of L. D is equal to trace of L. So, this is J times trace of uh, F dot F inverse and that is equal to 0. So, if J dot is equal to 0 for uh, as it is for an incompressible material, then uh, this is the relation that f and f dot must be sat must satisfy which means that uh, you cannot vary f and f dot independently of each other if you vary f you have to vary f dot if you vary f dot if you, you will have to vary f so uh, this argument that we made that uh, that if i vary this uh, the quantity inside the parenthesis doesn't get affected is not valid for an incompressible material is not valid for an incompressible material. So this uh, constitutive equation is valid for a compressible perfectly elastic material. For an incompressible perfectly elastic material, we will have to make some modifications to this argument in order to get a constitutive equation. Now, uh, for perfectly elastic compressible materials, we have envisaged a uh, uh, free energy density which depends on uh, F alone. Now, uh, this is not objective. Uh, we can see that by, uh, uh, by, by uh, recalling the fact that for a scalar function, objectivity means that uh, for in the plus coordinate system, which is a coordinate system of a rotating and translating observer, uh, the scalar should be the same and f will change to f plus, which we know if we know the instantaneous uh, rotation matrix between the stationary and the rotating reference frames, we know that f plus is equal to qf and uh, this has to be valid for any arbitrary q in order for this to be objective. So, for, uh, so, for, so if it's a function of f, then it's not going to be objective because obviously uh, this won't hold for any arbitrary q. However, uh, we can do a small trick. So, uh, we take uh, q f and since q is, an, is arbitrary, we can take q to be equal to r transpose. We have done this before, this problem before. So, we can write this as R transpose F by taking Q equal to R transpose and then uh, we know that uh, F can be split up into R times U, R transpose R is I. So, uh, this is equal to, so if we express instead of expressing, uh, uh, expressing this function in as a function of F, if we express it in, as a function of u, then it is invariant. Uh, u is an invariant, invariant uh, tensor. And since it's invariant tensor, u, remember, u is equal to u plus because c is equal to c plus. We have proved this before. And uh, since u is equal to u plus, psi naught u is equal to uh, psi naught uh, plus u. Uh, psi naught plus u plus. So, uh, expressing the free energy density as a function of u uh, will make it frame indifferent. Uh, keeping it as a function of f won't make it frame indifferent. But u, remember, is uh, dependent on f. Therefore, 
uh, this relation still holds this relation still holds but uh, this cannot be merely a function of f it has to be a function of u or it can be a function of certain other functions of u for example c is u square it can be a function of c e is equal to half c minus 1 so it can be a function of e and more importantly uh, this can be a function of um, not only e but in cases where uh, where uh, we have we are dealing with an isotropic material which uh, does not depend on orientation in those cases this can be a function of the invariance i1 i2 i3 of c or e or the eigenvalues lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 of c or e so uh, so for objectivity to be satisfied uh, shy not must not be a function of merely f but it should be a function of uh, c a function of u some function of u or a function of e and so on and on top of that if it's isotropic then it can be a function of i the invariance of c or e i1 i2 i3 or the eigenvalues of c or e which are lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda 3 in both these cases it would be an isotropic material and also will satisfy material plane indifference now uh, remember that P is equal to del psi naught F del F but uh, this is not objective so we have to express psi naught as uh, functions of U, C, E etc. So let us express it as some function psi 1 of let's say E. So then uh, P will be equal to del psi 1 of e which in turn is a function of f times del f which will imply that let's say pkl will be equal to del psi 1 del fkl but psi 1 is actually implicitly a function of e so let's say eij times e ij del fkl this is the chain rule which takes this function of e and gets its derivative with respect to f now uh, eij is f transpose f so this is f let's say m i f m j minus delta ij so this is eij and if i take its derivative with respect to fkl i'll get half times uh, delta mk delta il i am taking derivative of this with respect to fkl times fmj plus now i'll take derivative of this delta mk delta uh, jl f m i so uh, i can i can uh, simplify this a little bit further so this m can knock off so i'll have delta i l f k j plus this will knock off this delta j l f k i okay so now uh, plug this in here so let us multiply this by del psi 1 del e i j where e i j are the repeated indices so let's multiply it by this multiply this by del psi del e i j and then we will get half goes out del psi del e uh, this i is knocked off by this l so lj f kj 
plus the j gets knocked off by the l del shy uh, this should be shy one del shy one by uh, is j gets knocked off by l so e i l f k i now you can immediately see that these two terms are the same so uh, j is a repeated index so i can replace it by m i can replace this by m i can i is a repeated index i can replace this by m i can replace this by m as well and uh, i have two of them uh, e m l and e l m are the same because e is a, a symmetric matrix so this i can write as f K M del shy one del E M L, which means that uh, this remember was equal to P K L, so which this means that P is equal to F times del shy one del E, where uh, del shy one is a function of E, so uh, this is what I have. And then f inverse p is equal to s, which means that now I have the important relation that s is equal to del shy one So this is the important relation that I have. Now, uh, what it means is that if I uh, honoring uh, frame indifference or objectivity of the constitutive equation of the, of the strain energy density function if I express it as a function of E then I can get S directly by taking derivative of the function with respect to the green Lagrange strain. Now for an isotropic material let's say we have the further simplification that uh, Shy 1 is now given in terms of the invariance of E which are this, this, and this. And uh, we now have to calculate uh, the stresses, the constitutive equation. We can do that in terms of the second PK stress. We can simply use the relation that we have just derived. That is, this is, this is the relation that we have just derived. Uh, but shy one, we don't have shy one. We have shy tilde, which is a function of the i's. So we can do this further chain rule application further application of chain rule uh, to find out s i j which is which is now this this is what we have done here now these this function this function will be given to you and we will soon see some examples of, uh, of 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 free energy density functions in terms of i1 i2 i3 uh, but these derivatives these derivatives will have to be calculated from these relations now uh, fortunately there are uh, there are standard relations for the derivatives of uh, the invariance of uh, of a tensor second order tensor especially as a symmetric second order tensor and uh, those are not very difficult to derive so i1 for example is trace of e so it can be written as e k k and if I take derivative of I1 with respect to, let's say, Eij, what I get is delta Ki, delta Kj, which is delta Ij, which means that uh, the first invariant of any tensor, any second order tensor, taken derivative with respect to the tensor itself gives you the identity. The second one is trace E square, that is I1 square of uh, I1 square minus trace of uh, E square. E square is uh, E square is can be written as E uh, let's say uh, I K E K J that is E square and trace of that would be trace of that would be E M K E K M so this is trace of e square and if i take derivative of del i2 with respect to let's say again pij so what i will get is half 
times 2 i1 and del i1 del ij is delta ij that remains minus uh, let's take first the derivative of this that is delta m i delta k j e k m minus delta m j delta k i i'm taking derivative of this delta k i delta m j e m k so the first term becomes i1 delta ij minus the second term is half of uh, delta mi kj makes this e uh, j i plus makes this delta mj delta k i e j i which are the same for a symmetric tensor and then I have i1 delta ij minus e ij so the second invariant is i1 times i minus e this is the second invariant derivative of the second invariant with respect to the symmetric tensor the third invariant is determinant of e and uh, to derive that let me uh, find the fresh sheet let's clear everything here So, um, so let's try to do it here. So uh, we have derived uh, del i1 del e, that is i. We have derived del i2 del e, that is i1 i minus e. Now we are trying to derive del i3 del e. So uh, 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 easy way to do that is to start from the Kelly hamilton theorem. So, this is the Kelly Hamilton theorem. Take the derivatives of this. So, you get 3a square minus del i1 del a. So this is the Kelly Hamilton theorem for a matrix A. You can write it for E. So del I1 del A is square minus 2 I1 A uh, plus I2 I plus del I2 del A times A uh, is equal to del i3 del a. there's i i i uh, is a constant so it does not get affected by the and this is a matrix so uh, i have absorbed the i into this and written it as del i3 del a only now what we will have to do is we will have to replace these things uh, by the relations that we have already got so this we know is I and then here uh, this one uh, this one has to be replaced by uh, I1 I minus A and then if we if we now do the calculations we have 1a square here 1a square from here and 3a square so we are left with a square minus i1 a uh, plus i2 i 
is equal to del i3 del a so del i3 del e would be e square minus i1 e plus i2 i uh, we can do a further simplification we see that in the kelly hamilton theorem if we multiply bo both sides by a inverse this becomes a square this becomes a this becomes i and this becomes a inverse so uh, so a square minus i1 a plus i2 a is what we have here so this according to the kelly hamilton theorem is equal to i3 a inverse so this can be written as i3 e inverse so these are the three invariants uh, and now we can we can just split this up we can write this s i j is or or we can better uh, we write it in vector notation s is equal to del shy hat del i1 del i1 del e i2 So this is I3 E inverse. This is um, this is identity, and this is um, I1 I minus E. So putting these together, we will get an an expression for S, which is uh, the constitutive equation of the material in terms of S and the green lagrange strain tensor and that will be of this form where c0 c1 and c2 are the functions given here so if you know shy tilde you will be able to determine this function and therefore you will have a complete constitutive equation of the material now likewise an isotropic material perfectly elastic material can also be its free energy density can also be expressed as a function of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, which are the eigenvalues of C. Let's say that's the case. We know the form of this function. Uh, then uh, we know that these are, uh, so C is expressed as in the spectral decomposition. If n alpha are the eigenvalues of C, C can be expressed like this. U can obviously be written as lambda alpha, n alpha, n alpha. So these are the these are the spectral decompositions of C and U. Now, uh, now let us suppose that I have the free energy density given in terms of C, which means that I have already have this relation uh, S equal to. this I know but now I'm given a different function psi 2c which is equal to psi 1e so what I have to do is so this is what I'll have to do but we know that uh, e is equal to half c minus i which means that 2e equal to c minus i and therefore uh, c is equal to 2e plus i which means del psi del psi del c del e is equal to 2 and this becomes 2 times del psi 2 del c so uh, sij can be written as 2 times del psi 2 del cij however we are given 
things in terms of the eigenvalues of C, which are lambda alpha squared. So we have to do one further. So we have to do chi tilde, which is given to us, which are functions of lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. Lambda alpha squared are the eigenvalues of C. So this is what we will have to do. Now these will be easy to calculate because we are given chi hat as a function of lambda alphas. Uh, these are the functions which we need to calculate. Now, these again, these derivatives, uh, these are these are kind of uh, difficult to calculate, but uh, can be done. Uh, and a proof is given, uh, a derivation is given in Holzapfel. We will we will closely follow that. Now, what we do is uh, we start with uh, c equal to. to this and then we write dc small change in c as 2 lambda alpha d alpha there's a summation over alpha please remember that then i have lambda alpha square d and alpha So this is what I have. Okay. Now here let us pre-multiply and post-multiply by an alpha. We immediately see if we pre-multiply by an alpha and post-multiply by an alpha. Uh, so alpha can take values of 1, 2 and 3. So this is n1, n1, n2, n2, n3, n3. Suppose I multiply by n1, uh, pre-multiply by n1 and post-multiply by n1. So this one uh, will only return a non-zero value for uh, when n is equal to n1. For this summation, uh, n2, n2 will go to 0, n3, n3 will go to 0. Only n1, n1 will go to 1 and you will be left with 2 lambda alpha d lambda alpha. In case of 1, you will be left with 2 lambda 1 d lambda 1. Now here, uh, we again have, uh, let's say, uh, n1 dot n1 equal to 1, which means that n1, uh, n1 dot d n1 is equal to 0, because these are, these are orthonormal. Uh, and uh, n alpha n alpha dot d n alpha is also equal to 0. So when you pre-multiply by n alpha, this goes to 0. When you post-multiply by n alpha, this goes to 0. So these two terms will vanish and this is the only term that will remain. So this is the only term that you will have. So uh, starting from this, let me raise it. So I have n alpha dot dc times n alpha equal to 2 lambda alpha d lambda alpha. This is what I have. Now uh, dc is del c del lambda alpha d lambda alpha. So this is your dc and uh, so I have n alpha dot dc n alpha equal to 2 lambda alpha d lambda alpha uh, which I can write as uh, this look at this quantity so I have a a vector a dotted with let's say a times the same vector a. So this in, in initial notation would be written as a k, a k m a m, which can be written as a k m times a k a m, which uh, in, in, in tensor notation again would be a
so so this these two this expression and this expression are equivalent so we can write this as dc which is analogous to a times n alpha n alpha is equal to 2 lambda alpha d lambda alpha now this i know is del c del lambda alpha d lambda alpha and this is n alpha n alpha and that is so if i bring the 2 lambda alpha here i can write this 2 lambda alpha here that is equal to d lambda alpha which cancels out from both sides and i'm left with one here so uh, this times this is equal to one and uh, it can only be one when uh, this quantity this quantity is del lambda alpha del c so del lambda alpha, del c del lambda alpha into del lambda alpha del c is equal to one so this has to be equal to del lambda alpha del c which means that is equal to 2 lambda alpha n alpha n alpha so this is an important relation which leads us to the fact that del lambda alpha square del c is 2 lambda alpha c so the 2 lambda alpha so this and that is equal to and this is equal to simply n alpha so this leads to uh, a really important result, a really interesting result for uh, isotropic materials, and that is so. So I have I have this. I just proved this, and if we do that, then we can plug it into the expression for S. So these are n alpha n alpha, and when we plug it in this is what we get and this shows that the eigen vectors of s are the same as the eigen vectors of c which means that the principal directions of c and the principal directions of s are the same and the eigen values of s are these so uh, we can write this now in terms of that this is actually a spectral decomposition of s with these as eigenvalues so i can write the ath eigenvalue as this uh, once i have the, the eigenvalues of s i can find the eigenvalue of p which is fs and then p eigenvalues of p are this eigenvalues of sigma similarly found are these so uh, now i have these expressions in terms of eigenvalues and i know that the eigenvectors of c and s are coincident uh, coincident and that leads to these expressions for the eigenvalues. So this is a special form that you get when uh, your free energy density function is expressed in terms of the eigenvectors of C.